European exploration, maritime exploration on the water from 1450 to 1750. Now, when I say European explorers in the 1400s, you probably automatically think Columbus, and you should. He's obviously the most famous and probably the most important, but there's a lot more to it than just Columbus, as we'll see today. So last week, we kind of looked at some of the major land empires in Afro-Eurasia, the gunpowder empires and all that. Today, we're going to look at how European countries began expanding their empires overseas. Also, we're going to talk a lot about causes today, causes of historical events and processes, and focus specifically on the difference between a primary and secondary cause. And actually, what I was just saying a second ago about complexity in your DBQ, if there's a DBQ and it's about causes of an event, and you can talk about primary and secondary causes and give reasons why they're primary and secondary, you could be headed for a complexity point there. In fact, let's jump into that idea of primary and secondary causes um, right now in our warm up. Okay, I made this chart that can help you with causes of a major historical event. And I turned it into a PDF that is in the Google Drive that we use for these videos. And there's a link to it right below me in the information section about this video. You might need to click the see more to get it. And it says something about resources, extra resources or something like that. So if you would go ahead and pause the video now, take a second, download this PDF. And if you want, you might, if you have a printer, you might wanna print off a couple of copies because we're gonna be writing on these. Or if you'd rather just jot it down on a piece of paper, that's fine too. But take a second and then I'll go over what each of these parts means. So pause me now, get set up, and I'll be here when you get back. Okay, this chart is used, if you notice, only for causes. We're not talking about effects today. I know that you always put causes and effects together. I get it. But today we're only looking at causes, but primary and secondary causes of a major event. If you're gonna write an essay about causes, obviously the first thing that you're always gonna start with is contextualization. And as I was saying earlier, big picture processes, what are the big picture things happening in the world or in the region that you're talking about, but then kind of narrow it down to the specifics of the event. And if that's a little confusing, don't worry, because I'm about to show you an example of what I mean. Or actually, I should say you're about to practice an example here. Okay, below that, you have primary causes. Primary causes are the things that directly lead to the event. Primary cause happened, it caused the event. Notice there's an arrow. It is very obvious that A caused B. That's your primary cause. The primary cause happened and it immediately led to the event. Secondary causes though, those are not as straightforward. Secondary causes are more indirect. Secondary causes are things that, first off, they had to happen for this event to happen. They definitely caused the event, but it's indirectly, and it may not have been inevitable. In other words, you could imagine a world where the secondary cause happened, but that major event never did. Whereas with the primary cause, once the primary cause happened, that event pretty much had to happen. Now, also notice I have a box there with arrows in it. And I put arrows question mark because sometimes secondary sources have a one-to-one -one correlation. Secondary, I keep saying uh, sources, don't I? Okay, I'm gonna keep screwing that up today. We're not talking about primary and secondary sources. That's a totally different thing. If I say sources, I mean causes, okay? Anyway, sometimes there is a one-to-one -one correlation, secondary cause to primary cause to event. But most of the time it gets a lot messier. And I'll show you what I mean with an example here in a second. So here's what I'd like for you to do is we're gonna do a little practice with this. And we're gonna talk about something that all of you are sadly way too familiar with that right now and that is school closings. Now, I put school closings in Texas because like I said, on Friday, it was announced that 
schools in Texas are officially closed for the rest of the school year. Feel free when we're doing this to substitute your state or if your state has not closed down schools for the year, just think about why you've been out of school so far. You don't have to do Texas if you don't want to. And I know some of you are rolling your eyes right now because you're thinking to yourself, oh God, Lozier is from Texas. And people from Texas will just never shut up about being from Texas. And actually, yeah, you're, you're kind of right. But remember, I didn't grow up here, okay? I grew up in Louisiana and moved here to go to college. But I've been here for almost 25 years now. And I married a really nice Texas girl. And we raised two Texas boys. And I have two Texas dogs. So I feel like maybe I'm a Texan now. So, ugh. but I will tell you this. I may be a Texan now, but I will never, ever cheer for the Dallas Cowboys. I want to make that very clear to everyone. Okay, but anyway, we're getting, getting too far ahead. All right, so what I'd like for you to do is take a couple minutes and fill in this chart thinking about school closings right now for the 2019-2020 school year. If you want to stick with Texas, great. If you want to do another state, that's fine too. But go ahead and pause the video. Take about four or five minutes, trying to fill in as much of this as you can. If you're still a little confused about primary versus secondary causes, don't worry about it. I'll go over that here in a second. So ready, pause. Okay, here are your answers, or at least answers that I came up with. Again, yours might vary, and that is totally fine. If I had you write an essay about schools closing in Texas for the 2019-2020 school year, you start with your contextualization. Again, big picture topics. And notice I have some pretty big picture topics here. International travel, international migration is something you've been talking about all year long. But I'm making it a little bit more specific to our time period right now, that in the year 2020, there's been more international travel than ever in history. International travel is cheaper than ever before. It's easier than ever before. I'd rather fly in an airplane across the Atlantic than have to go on a boat for a couple of weeks. Okay, that helps the transportation technology. It also happens because our international economy is more connected than ever before. But of course, with that, we know that disease, sprout, just, ah, disease spreads through travel and trade. Again, that is something that we've seen throughout history. Also, if you wanna make it a little bit more specific to our topic, schools really spread disease. I mean, y'all know it, you've been in the hallways. There's not a whole lot of social distancing happening in high school hallways. Or have y'all been to an elementary school lately? It is, there's, there's just way too many bodily fluids. There's way too much touching and there's definitely not enough hand washing in those places. And we know the diseases spread in schools. So that would be kind of my contextualization. Big picture, these are things that you have to understand if you're gonna understand why schools are closing right now. Okay, then we move to our secondary causes. Secondary cause number one, there is a coronavirus that has appeared on the scene has begun spreading around the world. Now remember, you have to have that in order to close schools. There has to be the threat of the coronavirus. But that doesn't make schools in Texas having to close inevitable. It's quite possible that this virus could have spread to other parts of the world, never touched Texas, and Texas schools would have gone on just fine. You also could think about lack of knowledge or preparation, whether you want to talk about the federal level, the state level, the local level, however you want to get into it. I am not going to get into this right now. I promise you I'm not going to get into politics right now because... No matter what I say, I'd end up like making like 40% of you mad. So we're just going to not talk about this. But also understand, yes, the full story has not been written on COVID-19. But we do know that we were not 100% prepared or have 100% complete knowledge of the situation. If we had, things would be a lot different right now. But both of those, again, are secondary causes. Yes, they're important, but they didn't lead to schools closing in Texas directly. But the primary causes, these are things that once they happened, you had to close the schools for the school year. One, as of this weekend, there are about 15,000 cases of COVID-19 in Texas. That's a lot. Schools are going to have to close for that. Other primary cause, students and teachers and parents are simply afraid to send their kids to school. I mean, 
think about it. If your school just magically opened up tomorrow, would you really want to go to the building and be crammed into a classroom with a bunch of students? I don't know that I would. I don't know that I want my kids to go there. So school officials know that if, even if they opened up schools, attendance levels would be way down. And then also, let's just kind of be honest here. We're getting towards the end of the school year. Originally, Texas schools were supposed to open up like the middle of May. There would have been like two weeks left. So I think at some point, most school officials looked at it and said the school year is pretty much done. If this happened in October, we would have kept schools closed for a little while, but eventually opened them back up. But notice all three of those are primary direct causes of Texas schools closing for the school year. Without those, Texas schools would still be open or opening soon. Now, one other important note there put at the bottom. Governor Greg Abbott, he's the governor of Texas. He was the one that on Friday announced schools in Texas would be closed. I've seen in a lot of student writing, whether it be in my classroom or when I grade AP tests, students will put things like that as a cause of schools closing. But guys, the fact that Governor Abbott announced on Friday schools would close is not a cause. It is the event itself. It is the school closure. It would be like, okay, let's say I asked you to analyze the causes of why the Kansas City Chiefs won the Super Bowl this year. If you said one cause of the Chiefs winning is because they scored more points than the 49ers, well, that's the definition of winning. Yes, the Chiefs won because they scored more points than the other team. But that's not a cause, that's the event itself. A cause of the Chiefs winning would be Patrick Mahomes is really, really amazing at football. That would be a cause. The fact that the Chiefs scored more points is the thing itself. So just be careful when you're listing out causes that you're not listing out another way to say the event itself. If you have this open as a PDF, leave it open because we're going to come back to it uh, at the end of this session today. But let's get into history stuff now. And like I said, we're going to talk about European maritime exploration today, kind of in the 1400s and 1500s. We're not going to get into the Columbian Exchange today. Smith is going to do that tomorrow. We're not going to talk about the Spanish conquering the Aztecs, Incas, all that. We're going to get to that later on in the week. Today, I just want to think about why do we see maritime exploration in the 1400s and the 1500s? And there's a couple of reasons why. First off, there's a lot of new technologies that begin to make their way to Europe, and Europeans begin to modify these technologies to create faster boats. By the way, I listed out a couple of different technologies you don't necessarily need to know all of these. As long as you know one, you're in a pretty good spot here. But think about new types of boats, the caravel boats that are pictured here. There's lateen sails that for sails are more triangular. The point is that these new boat designs and sail designs are help making the uh, boats more efficient when it comes to harnessing wind power. Because remember, we are still in a time where wind is the thing that's going to push boats. Well, I guess there's still oars for canoes, but if we're talking about large boats, it is sails. These are still sailboats. We are obviously not to steam engines yet. That's still a couple hundred years away in the Industrial Revolution. But these new designs make it more efficient to travel using wind power. The Portuguese become experts at building these very fast ships. And obviously having faster, lighter ships is important. It's going to be important in trade because you can get from point A to point B faster. There's also, of course, a military advantage to it as well. Compasses. Okay, compasses are a thing that have been around for a while. And people in East Asia have been using them since almost the 12th century. But knowledge of compasses really did not become widespread in Europe until around this time. And obviously, if you're out on the water and you need to figure out what direction to go, compasses are going to be there to help you. Speaking of being stuck out in the middle of the water and not knowing where you are, we know that for years and years and years before this, 
sailors have been using positions of the stars. But now you start to see better maps of the heavens being made. Sailors are getting a lot better at identifying stars and where they are to help them figure out where they are in the water. You also see an increased knowledge of wind patterns in the Atlantic Ocean. At all. If you can figure out which way the wind is blowing at what time of the year or which way the water is blowing, you're obviously going to be a huge advantage. And that's one of the things that helps Europeans to actually eventually reach the Americas, is that current and wind patterns in the Atlantic Ocean are actually fairly stable. If you know what you're doing, and by the way, don't ask me to explain because I don't know what I'm doing when it comes to sailing. I prefer to just stay on land. But if you know what you're doing, it's pretty easy to predict wind and current patterns in the Atlantic Ocean. They're a lot more stable than say somewhere out in the Pacific where it's a lot more variable. But the point is new technologies, new knowledge of this is obviously going to help increase maritime exploration. But wait a minute, where did these technologies and knowledges come from? Well, I'm glad you asked. Y'all remember the Mongols? Of course you do. The answer is always the Mongols. The Mongols are the answer to every question in world history. Okay, maybe not every question, but a lot of questions. Okay, we've talked plenty about the Mongols. They took over almost all of Asia. They got to the outskirts of Europe. They never really conquered large parts of Europe though. But all the trade routes that they reconnected began to make their way into Europe. And so of course, knowledge from the Middle East, from East Asia, all are starting to make their way back into Europe. Also, remember, this is the beginnings of the Renaissance in Europe as well. Now, when you think of the Renaissance, you probably think of art. And yes, art is a huge part of the Renaissance, no doubt about it. But the Renaissance also does foster a big focus on education, especially on science education and technology. Remember Da Vinci, you know, for his paintings and you know, art and all that, but he was a pretty prolific inventor as well. And so you're starting to see sailors tinkering with new designs for ships, like latine sails, caravels, etc. Also, I brought up the fact before that governments in Europe, especially in Western Europe, I should say, were pretty unstable before the 1400s. Kingdoms grew, kingdoms fell apart, it wasn't a very centralized government. But now after the plague, as trade money is starting to come into Europe as well, we start to see more solidified and centralized governments. You start to see the makings of modern countries in Europe, like France, England, Spain is about to take several kingdoms and unify them into one country. Germany and Italy, they're still a ways away. Don't worry about them for now. But with these new governments, monarchs feel the need for more money because of course more money means more political power. How do kings get money? Through taxes. Where do you get taxes from? Through trade. So you see competition over trade routes. Um, so we start to see this desire for more long distance trade routes by Europeans. Also remember that most of these countries are fairly small when you think about it geographically. None of them is as large or powerful as say like the Ottoman Empire or the dynasties in China and East Asia. So again, there's a lot of rivalry between these kind of smaller states. The problem though with long distance trade in Europe is if you're thinking about land routes, land routes from Europe into Asia go through those gunpowder empires that we talked about last week the Ottomans, the Safavids, the Mughals, et cetera. And by the way, those empires are totally fine with having European merchants travel through. Because again, if merchants are traveling through your area, that means more tax money. But Europeans don't wanna have to be taken advantage of by those Muslim empires. They're being seen as taken advantage of by the Muslim empires. So they start to look to the water to figure out new routes to Asia. All right. So what happens next? Well, the Portuguese are some of the first to begin exploring new routes to Asia. The Portuguese begin by sailing around Africa. 
They start setting up outposts on the coasts of Africa, as well as in South Asia, all along the Indian Ocean coast. But remember, for the Portuguese, it wasn't about buying and selling goods. It wasn't about being involved in trade routes. Because to be honest, the Portuguese didn't really have much that anybody in Asia wanted. For them, it was about controlling those trade networks. And they were able to do it because of their new technology, their faster ships. Also because, remember, uh, the Chinese, after the death of Zheng He, had pretty much kind of mothballed their entire fleet. Remember, the Chinese had a giant fleet in the Indian Ocean that was pretty much gone by the time the Portuguese arrived. Something tells me if the Chinese had still been there in the Indian Ocean when the Portuguese arrived, the Portuguese would have been gone right on back home after they saw those huge Chinese ships. But there was a power vacuum in the Indian Ocean and the Portuguese are able to move in and take control. And you're gonna look at that some more tonight in your homework. Then of course we have the Spanish hiring Christopher Columbus to find a new, land, a new water route to Asia through the Atlantic Ocean. Hey, Lozero hasn't told a really bad dad joke today. <laughs> Get it, because they weren't Pacific, because <laughs> he was in the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> okay, some of you are laughing. I know you are, just admit it, it's fine. But Columbus, of course, is looking for a Western route to Asia, instead discovers the Americas. And after the discovery of the Americas, you then start to see the English and the French and the Dutch and others begin to start their own explorations, looking for possibly a Northwest Passage. Maybe there's a way to go around the Americas to the North to make their way into to China. Of course, they don't find it, but of course you do see these countries beginning to settle their own colonies in North America as well. Again, we're not gonna get into that today. That'll come more later in the week. Okay, hey, y'all remember this chart that we looked at 10 minutes ago? Let's look at it again. What I'd like for you to do is to go ahead and take a few minutes. If you want, copy this chart down again on your paper or print off a new one. And I want you to take a few minutes and fill this in about European exploration in the Americas and Asia from the 1400s and 1500s, okay? So start with your contextualization, think big picture, and then kind of narrow it down to 1400s and 1500s. Think about the primary causes, what are the things that directly led to European exploration? And then think about your secondary causes. What are the things that happened before the primary causes that you know, needed to happen in order for European exploration to happen, but maybe that did not make European exploration inevitable. And by the way, if there are some arrows between your secondary and primary causes, great, draw them. If there's no arrows, that's fine too. Maybe there's multiple arrows going different directions. Put that in as well, okay? So go ahead and take about five minutes, pause me now, and then when you're ready, start back up. Ready? Pause. Okay, here are a couple of answers that I came up with. You know, again, you might have something different and that is totally fine as well. But if you gave me an essay about European exploration in the Americas and Asia, the first thing I would talk about is my contextualization. Like we were saying a second ago, knowledge from the Islamic world, knowledge from East Asia, if you wanna throw in the Mongols, that's how it got here, that would be good too. I would also maybe talk about the Renaissance and its focus on science and technology. Because again, we're thinking about big picture ideas, transfer of knowledge from trade routes. But then I'm getting a little bit more specific that the knowledge came from the Islamic world and from East Asia to Europe through the Mongols. And then I would talk about the Renaissance as well. It's kind of an outcropping of that. All right, if you're thinking about primary causes, the Portuguese are wanting to control Indian Ocean trade. That is going to make a direct lead, direct cause into European exploration in the Indian Ocean. Columbus discovering the America, of course, kicks off European exploration of the Americas and eventually conquest of the Americas. The British and French still looking for a way to find the Northwest Passage. 
there's another primary cause that sets off exploration as well. But then you got to think about the secondary causes as well. Like, okay, those primary causes directly caused European exploration to increase in the 1400s and 1500s. But what were the secondary causes of that? That's where you get into the new technologies, the new types of ships, the new types of sails. That's where you get into the rivalry among the European states, fighting over territory, fighting over resources, fighting over trade routes. And if you look at my arrows, I know that it seems like a jumble of arrows, but each secondary cause, I drew an arrow to two primary causes, but you know, you could probably make an argument for different arrows going different ways, and that's fine. You also, by the way, could make an argument for, no, 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 that's not a primary cause. That should be a secondary cause. And listen, that's fine too. If you can back up your argument, you can frame these in different ways to make them secondary or primary causes. That's fine. But I really do want you to see the difference there. The secondary causes are still important. You wouldn't see European exploration in the Americas without that. But they did not make it inevitable where primary causes are the direct lead into it, okay? Also, I put a little note at the bottom again, thinking about what you should not put. I didn't put the Portuguese building settlements around the Indian Ocean because that is part of the exploration and settlement in the Indian Ocean. That is the definition of the thing itself. All right, so let's summarize what we've done today. Hey, first off, big takeaway. If I say European maritime expansion, I'm not just talking Columbus. There's a lot more to it, okay? Also, you need to make sure you understand the difference between primary and secondary causes. Primary causes are much more immediate. Secondary causes are a little bit more indirect. And obviously, all of this talk about maritime expansion is going to lead to new empires in the Americas and eventually in Asia as well. It's gonna to lead to the Columbian Exchange, but we're gonna talk about that more in the next few days.